Greetings in a, in a egalitarian territory and welcome to everyone. It's again my honour and privilege to deliver the President's address. Actually, I can look down here, can't I? So I'd like to make some acknowledgements to our life members and record our condolences of the passing this year of Mr Ross Mortimer and Mr Mick Maloney. Each passing year, I sort of realise more and more the value of the NTCA to our members and admire more the foresight and perseverance of those industry leaders that forged our association some 33 years ago. I, I'm old enough now to recall the early NTCA gatherings in Catherine in the 1980s, where the dinners fitted into Kirby's restaurant and the entertainment involved Terry Underwood turning hard case cattlemen into thespians, performing in women's clothes and the like. And some of them are here today, Alan. Um, we're now of an age of an association where I'm filling a bit of a gap while the second generations are starting to take their place in the lead of the NTCA. Also, uh, our industry has always been up front in offering equal opportunities to women, particularly for work. Many of our family and corporate stations are run by true partnerships. My wife says it's more than equal when it comes to work and I sincerely thank her for all the extra burden she takes on as part of me doing this job and acknowledge the input of all the other spouses and partners of the executive committee members and the other members of the association that work on all our behalves. I'd also like to acknowledge my neighbours, in particular Avago, Hidden Valley, Kalala and Gorry for always stepping up at home when I'm not there. It takes a district to raise an NTCA president, as the old saying goes. I thank the association staff. Tracy's work ethic and the hours she puts in, total dedication to the people of our industry, the community, the honesty and integrity that they deal with government, customers, media, is simply outstanding. It's a lead willingly followed by the rest of the staff and we thank them sincerely as we thank Tracy and her family support team for all they've done for us over the last 12 months. Of course, Tracy's taken this to ridiculous extremes this year, collecting any number of gongs and, and uh, including the NT's most powerful person award, even, even dragged Luke up from number 49 to the second most powerful couple. <laughs> so planning for prosperity. Prosperity infers not only some sort of permanent profitability, more permanent profitability, but also a measure, a measure of quality of life and comfort. Over the last year, we've had that very rare confluence of good prices and good seasons. It certainly sets us up for a prosperous future at the enterprise level at the very least. At the industry and community level, however, it's been marked by numerous attacks on our prosperity, by uninformed decisions, in the South, without consultation, in reactions to a noisy mob testing the resolve of both our association and membership, or by decisions by trading partners about how they want to organise food and, and our role in the provision of food for their populations. To me, though, our greatest risk is allowing all these external distractions to cloud the attack that's going on on the very productivity and sustainability of our land and our people. It's, it's been a cracker of a year, it's, it's one for the classics, so I've gone to the classics for some quotes. In poten potentially the best opening paragraph to a novel ever, Charles Dickens wrote of the French Revolution, a time of mob rule and out of touch aristocracy. Remarkably prescient to modern times. So that it's a, it's a novel that starts, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief and the epoch of incre incredulity. I knew I'd have trouble, tr struggle with that. It was the season of light and the season of darkness in South Australia. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. It was the era of the gilded meritocracy, it was the moment of the deplorables. I added that last one myself actually, but. Dickens used to write after a trip to Dan Murphy's before Dan was transported to Australia for having too big a bottle shop. 
So apart from Islamic State, the mobs of today assassinate people's characters and ideas on Twitter and Facebook or through the Human Rights Commission. Reflecting the will of the mob, our governments and bureaucrats make policy decisions that make Louis XVI appear as grounded as Celeste Patterson or Daryl Kerrigan. So for us, Dickens' tale of two cities becomes the tale of the lot-fed cities and the free-range bush. So in the best hybridisation of a modern Dickens, modern day Dickens and how a presidential address should sound, I've just borrowed something. And say to you, let's make the NT great again. But I'm not going to wear that for too long before it goes everywhere. <laughs> Yeah, it's gone, it's too late. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but let's talk about cows. Much time has taken up talking about the issues that stop us talking with and working with our cattle. The pastures they graze on, the rain, the water, the sunlight and the soil that provide us with our greatest natural competitive or comparative advantage in the breeding of beef cattle in the Northern Territory. Comparative advantage is the foundation stone of free trade and we must protect it and enhance it all we can. This past year, I've been part of a group charged with delivering the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework for industry, which objectively tries to objectively describe our credibility across four pillars of sustainability, which is an absolute requirement for prosperity. Now, I understand that armac has been a little bit slow and except this was supposed to be released yesterday but it's not quite there and in but in NTCA tradition if the south doesn't move quick enough we've gone anyway so here it is um, I'll ask forgiveness Howard mm. the aim was to achieve such a thing for me without requiring more book work at the station level but instead using all of the good industry systems and monitoring we've had over the years to actually get the job done and tell our story so I've always been impressed with the ability of old bushmen, black or white, to get to the nub of issue in just a few words, something I've never mastered. But I, so in this case, I thought I'd try and get in early. So I, the first meeting I popped up and said, sustainability is simply about cattle, country, kids and cash. Anyway, Richard Raines was there, the other end of the scale, he was the marketer, and he said, what about the customer, he said. And, uh, the bottom of his email, he had a little bit of wisdom he likes to impart to it, and he said, and at the bottom of his email said, all of human existence relies on the top six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. Confucius, apparently. Good, I thought. Meeting one, we've nailed it. But then as the old Morton joke goes, the professionals got involved and the consultation started. I've got to tell you that I learnt that globally the sustainability industry is second only to the climate change and health bureaucracies which actually makes it third. But, so we spent 12, 12 months looking at about a gazillion indicators, processing and analysing them to death, and consulting with everyone, and ended up with 22 pages of framework and the story about it. The framework really is about telling our story of the cattle, productivity and welfare, the country, condition, cover, tree grass balance, our kids' contribution to nutrition and health of rural, urban and export communities, and cash, profit and prosperity. And it all relies on the top six inches of soil and the fact that it rains. Using it, we can, we can describe and improve our production systems and argue with each other and plan and tell our stories at home and abroad. Due in part to customer demand and in part to ever diminishing resources from government, the beef industry and our individual enterprises within it need to be more responsible and proactive in monitoring and regulating its own performance and the management of endemic diseases without con contributing to red tape. It's not a get out for Kevin DeWitt and the rest of government though who need to recognise and maintain their responsibilities in regulation and border protection. Clearly, we need to do this efficiently, but we need to be crystal about the significant risks involved if we do not practise what we preach, particularly in regard to animal welfare and environmental stewardship and commit to strive to be continually better at what we do. We need to maintain and enhance the trust of our customers, our consumers and the deplorables wherever in the globe they may live. 
We've talked plenty about animal welfare here over the years, so I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that today, except to say that we need to ensure that our husbandry practices from station to the processing facilities are humane, productive and efficient. The major disease-free status of Australia is one of our strongest competitive advantage and it must be protected at all costs. Protection from diseases such as FMD must remain a priority of industry and government. The recent importation of buffalo meat into Indonesia just lays that risk a little bit and is a timely reminder of the need to remain vigilant of real diseases potentially on our doorstep. With respect to environmental stewardship, as an industry we commonly state our love of the land and our responsible stewardship of it. But how well are we doing? Here locally the pastoral land board has been monitoring for years and the monitoring effort as it is shows respectable district results for land condition dependent on season. But as politics and resources have dictated, it's an imperfect measure to date. The promise of remote sensing methodology for this sort of monitoring in the pastoral estate has been long promised, but yet unrealised. But there is stuff around to help us put seasons into historical perspective. And I've just, this, this has just come out from the local government, DPI people and co, and I've just picked two of them. It just uh, shows some of the seasonal conditions we've had to live with. There is a bit of a note under that one from the Southern Alice Springs district that says you're likely to have a few fires this year. But it's a truly remarkable season throughout. But there is, the ability to do stuff from satellites is improving all the time and we've got to learn to live with it and use it to our advantage. At a national and an industry level, we've been preoccupied and diverted for nearly two decades with the role of carbon dioxide in changing climate and have spent billions researching it and legislating efficient industries out of efficient ones. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there's now monitoring satellite technology around, and it's been around for a good while, that shows how much CO2 is circulating around the globe. And there is a, there's an address there if you want to check on that. It's actually a video that goes through the whole year. But I think you get the picture about where the CO2 is. Along with other studies and measures, I can say to you that Australia is actually a net sink for carbon dioxide nearly all the time. Even when the Queenslanders were clearing at their hardest and the drought was about an El Nino, Australia was largely a net sink for carbon dioxide. I'm pretty sure the politicians know this. The bureaucrats know this. I think the line is we shouldn't be wasting any more money on this. The bad news is that a lot of this sinking is thanks to woodland thickening in North Australia. We don't have a carbon dioxide or a climate change problem in North Australia. We have an arboreal obesity epidemic. Having been an observer of such things for four decades now, it's my personal feeling, belief, I even have objective data to back it up, which is a novelty these days, that the threat sustainability in the north is at least the data suggest is in the north of the NT is the greatest threat to sustainability we have, and I think it's the same across all of the northern woodland systems. You can see there that on average over the last 20 years, apparently, for every hectare of land in North Australia, we've been putting on somewhere about 1,000 to 1,200 kilos per hectare. Beef, we get 100 to 200, perhaps. So the problem simply stated is that more trees equals less grass, equals less carrying capacity or more overgrazing and soil loss. Not to forget changes to the biodiversity associated with grasslands which are being turned into woodlands. If you're not burning late at appropriate time frames, if you're trying to farm carbon, if you're advocating early burns, if you're not permitted to combat woody thickening by clearing and managing cleared areas, then you're contributing to a creeping unsustainability. And what have our mob-fed government and industry R&D dollars been doing over this time? Arguing about an acceptable figure for kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted per kilo of beef produced. And playing the Eurocentric Kyoto Protocol game. And then they tell us that the northern industry is going broke. Cue Phil Holmes later. 
Industry R&D needs to get out of climate politics and into landscape management and production. Economic resilience. Rising demand for our products in Asian markets and beyond and the toll of drought on the national herd elsewhere has created the perfect storm for property values and changes of ownership locally. Over the last 12 months, there have been 20 sales of NT leases completed or commenced. You can trust this, I got the figures from Beef Central. So if you just have a look at that, from the dark days of 2011, 12, 13, when you couldn't sell land in the Northern Territory, that's the number of pastoral leases. Some 30% of the leases in the Northern Territory have changed hands over the last three years, which makes for a big change in population and demographic. We welcome all the new people and the companies to the NT cattle industry. I appreciate your voter confidence in investment in the future of the North. It's been my experience that up here, you're judged on how well you do your job, that you said you are going to do, not on how much money you turn up with, what country, state or school you'd been to, what church, football code or political party you believed in. But the worst thing we can do in the North is start to believe in our own bulldust. Doesn't matter how much you paid per beast area or how much you talk it up, Productivity is still largely controlled by land capability, water availability and the season that drives it. The country will not produce any more grass and the cattle won't grow any faster or bigger just because the land price has gone up. And if you aren't controlling your woody weeds and thickening, the equation is worse. The productivity versus stocking rate relationship is unforgiving. If your production rates are static or declining, the first place to look is at the first principles of grazing land management. This is where our access to markets which can afford to pay for a quality product, safe, tasty, consistent, free range, is key. If we're paying more for our grass as well as the other inputs, we need to be running and selling a more valuable animal and product. The old comparative advantage we had of low cost production is quick, quickly changing and we need to change with it. Our, in, our product integrity systems must be rigorous, trustworthy, comprehensive, and allow for product, product branding. None of this is new. Crombie was lecturing us about this 20 years ago, so, but it has come to pass. The, allegedly, the NT, comedy, sorry, the NT economy is in a parlous state. An unhealthy proportion of industry in the Northern Territory relies on public funding for its existence. We, however, can be proud of the cattle industry's contribution to the NT economy, both historically and currently, and in prospect. Families and companies have, in, have currently invested about $4.5 billion in assets for raising beef cattle in the NT, and the industry directly earns a $1 billion or more a year, mostly from exports foreign income. We are a rare industry in the Northern Territory. Significant sustainable growth is possible with regionally and enterprise specific approaches for the beef industry, but there is no way that the beef sector alone can drag the NT, NT out of its mendicant state. The dilemma of our time is if and how our industry can coexist with an unconventional shale gas industry. Presently, the only left field potential for balancing the books in the NT to some extent. Despite throwing the northern beef industry under the vegetation management bus, the politically polite energy policies of both state and federal government over the last two decades has cost us jobs, manufacturing industries and added cost to those of us who still survive. Without a major shift in direction, there's only worse to come. Already our beef sector is paying some three times as much as the, uh, for processing than it costs in America even, not to mention in Asia, partly due to energy costs as well as wages. Trade between nations allows both nations to do the things they are best at and can do it cheapest, comparative advantage, to the mutual benefit of both populations. So when Australia is full of coal, natural gas and uranium, why don't we have cheap power to improve our comparative advantage? Why would we only sell our cheap stuff and then try and impose expensive and unreliable renewables for ourselves? When the price of cattle goes up in a live export market, perhaps, the eastern states market have to respond by raising their prices. 
I can't see why it's not the same with coal, gas or whatever it is. I, but anyway, I, I think it's called free market, I'm not sure. Governments, however, creating markets, whether it's renewable energy or carbon or anything else, seem only to be able to foster another class of short-term carpetbaggers that cream off public money without adding any value. This is not really germane, it's, it's a bit of a stretch to have this in here, but I had a number of Bill Leake cartoons I wanted to put up there in, as a memory to the great cartoonist who died recently, but I thought I couldn't get into too much trouble with the Human Rights Commission and the mob if I put up a couple of old white blokes, one of them dead. So, but anyway, um, for the prosperity of all Territorians and Australians, we need to find a way of protecting our pastoral resources and providing a safe, secure, affordable energy for industry, homes, transport, and doing something to get it, the NT off the national teat. We need to focus on our own people more. And for the second year in, the row, in a row, we need to lament the passing of a member through a work-related aviation accident. This year, Billy Hayes of Alice Springs, he, he once again, he left behind a young family and the associated mess to clean up. Ours is a job that has risks. However, for the sake of the family, we blokes in particular need to use more common sense for ourselves and our workers. We should always make sure that we don't leave fuel in the bowser behind us, runway behind us, or air above us. And leaving a beast in a paddock is a far better outcome than someone leaving in a body bag. Can we not lament someone's passing next year? Please. When my neighbour recently decided to get a helicopter, as they all do, and learned to fly it at 50 something, his daughter returned from a nice, safe job in Canberra teaching persuasive text to the next generations of public servants with the following strong advice. Father, in the tragic but not entirely unexpected event that you kill yourself in this thing, you will need to make sure you have a death folder prepared. Like a father, she's really wrong, and as part of a sustainable management, we should have a plan for passing over knowledge and management systems regardless of the time or planning of our departure. Beef cattle enterprises, private or company, are complicated beings with intricate knowledge built over, over the years. The, ac as the acquisition of this pastoral wisdom takes a long time, so it makes sense to share it across generations of family or management from the earliest opportunity. From my own experience, it'd make a bit of sense to start the replacement program a bit earlier. Otherwise, you're still paying for education at 70. We take, as an industry, our community responsibility seriously and look to the long term. We continue with a successful real jobs program for young Indigenous kids looking to get into the pastoral workforce. The Indonesian student program with our friends in Indonesia and our young NTCA program. Sustainability of the pastoral and the bush communities is, however, under pressure from people who tweet and podcast and message on mobile phones and trip on power from the lot-fed inner city suburbs of Sydney and that ilk. So this year, we've been, we've had our communities attacked by the Bureau of Meteorology, communications, the NBN, NHVR, PC, FWC, WWF and the ABC. Following the bomb removing the Barclay weather radar, radar services without any consultation, refusing even to offer any operational funding in the event that the industry and others could find the sort of money to put a new radar there, is just amazing. The ACMA from the middle of Melbourne tried to make linking of UHF repeater towers illegal and 40 channel UHF CBs. Thankfully, and I think in large part to Senator Matt Canavan and others, that got reversed. The Productivity Commission reckoned we didn't need a USO, a universal service obligation for landlines. The Fair Work Commission has invented apps to spy on employers on mobile phones, and the WWF buys drones to spy on landholders and the way they do their job. The NBN has a fair use policy restricting use in the bush, but has the capacity to supply services to Qantas from the Skymaster satellite. 
What takes the cake, however, is the national broadcaster unilaterally deciding that the bush no longer needs a shortwave radio. If we go back to the tale of two cities time, Marie Antoinette, without consulting the French mob, when told the peasants had no bread to eat, stated, let them eat cake, not long before a trip to the guillotine. At the recent Senate hearings, the MD of the ABC, when told that people, how much their decision about removing shortwave sucked, said, let them download podcasts. The new ABC chairman from Balmain, complete with, and I quote, elaborate rowing cufflinks, offers little sucker. As he states, again, the importance to the ABC of enhancing digital services to millennials. I have a solution that not solely relies on the guillotine. A national broadcaster that does not broadcast local ABC radio to all Australians is not a national broadcaster, and the government can take the money back and give it to someone who will. Communications Minister Fifield just took 80, buck, 80 million bucks back from Senator Brandis to give back to the Arts Council. And I can think of nothing more artistic than a few transmission towers spreading culture across the migratory masses of the outback. So today I announce the launch of the Radio Outbackistan Prospectus. It'll broadcast night and day on the shortwave band from Catherine and Alice Springs. There'll be two channels, OBC1, News and local affairs, we might take some ABC programming, some commercial programming, we might have the early morning breakfast session followed by Alan Jones, followed by Daryl Manzi, I don't know. But there will be no Philip Adams, there'll be no Charlie King until he learns about rugby. The programs will all be in English, but local news and events can be broadcast in any language for groups that don't have their own language broadcast. There'll be religious programming on Sunday, Australia all over. And Saturday, Tales from the Tinny. There'll be a local management board and consultative committee of listeners who will decide the programming, apart from those few givens. The second channel, OBC2, will be sport. International matches come first, except for soccer and basketball. Then interstate competitions, then local club matches. The local Aussie rules matches will only be broadcast in Creole. You'll not be able to text or tweet comments into Carl Curtin. You'll just listen to radio. If you do get on, it'll have to be on a satellite phone. If there's ever a royalties for regions programs rolled out in the Territory, it'll be put towards the development of a superior new mass free-to-air broadcast technologies to replace shortwave. There's some breaking news coming up there across the screen. As we speak here today, there's an action in the federal court in Sydney with respect to the class action, which is now into its sixth year. Despite Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Abbott promising us that the, the government would be model litigants in this case, it has dragged on for another two years. And it appears today that despite a comprehensive discovery period in process, that there are emails missing, three days of emails blanks, there's been no nothing found out of the Minister's office, there were use of private emails, all sorts of stuff going on that really speaks to whether the model litigancy of the federal government is as we thought of someone who is doing the right thing and in fact it's actually a clay model. But anyway, that's just not moving. So it's a pretty big day in the class action today depending on the outcome, but uh, so stay tuned. So in conclusion, we live in exciting times for sure, with prosperity and opportunity staring us in the face at industry and enterprise level. We contribute economically and culturally, but our communities are being marginalised and undervalued. We must protect and enhance the comparative advantages for our own and the greater good, marketing a safe product with integrity that is desired around the world. Remember though, that this is firstly based on a biological system that is based on the top six inches of rain, soil and the rain. Underground water, pastures, cows that are managed and husbanded by informed, productive people that have a plan that deals with today and the next generation. With prosperity, 
we may well get to live like kings in grass castles. Perhaps not of the Durack variety, but maybe the Daryl Kerrigan variety. And with that in mind, let's hope that the rest of today and tonight is going straight into the pool room. The vibe. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day.